But I also know that when he was asked what the difference is between the federal cause of action and his proposal, and that in Mr. Fletcher's proposal has been worked on, he didn't know because it hasn't been written yet. When he was asked questions about damage limitations and what they might exactly be and how they'd work, he didn't know because it hasn't been written yet. I think that basic minimal standards of procedural fairness would require that the committee not consider making the text in order until it's been written, that the House not be required to consider the text until there's been some adequate time to take a look at this. The, the base bill was introduced in February. Yes, it's been modified since then, but it's been out there in the public domain for the members to look at on the World Wide Web since February. The main amendment that I assume the committee is going to make in order is not yet written. This is something that affects every person in the country. It affects an industry that's about 14 percent of the country's economy. It will affect decisions that affect the basic health of every person that we represent. And the legislation that we're going to consider has not yet been written. I think that's extraordinary. And what we would ask is that uh, due time be given for consideration of this bill. I know there's been discussion of, of this consideration today, now that it's Thursday. I think that would be highly irregular. There's been some discussion of considering on Friday. I think that's not an adequate period of time. At the very least, the committee ought to consider giving the Congress several weeks to consider the consequences of this legislation. And with that, I would yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, if I could just add, uh, this, uh, according to our legislative calendar, is still Wednesday. <laughs> Even though some people may think it's Thursday, it is still Wednesday. Uh, but let me just, but. God would say it's Thursday. Let me just point out uh, to the gentleman uh, uh, from New Jersey and others that we have all looked at liability schemes with regard to to health insurance for eight years. And we've been around this block inside and out. And I venture to say that, uh, that the language, when we see it, uh, will be familiar to us. We may agree or disagree, but I, trust me, I, I have no doubts that, it, that whatever the scheme is, it will be familiar to us. Because I don't think there has been a liability scheme uh, that it hasn't been tried by one side or the other over the last eight years as we've tried to come to some resolution of this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lambert. This isn't all that extraordinary, Rob. We did it yesterday. <laughs> and be before, and before they, they get finalized in the rule, they were in, in print, just as this one will be. Thank you. Mr. Frost. Thank you. Ms. Price. Thank you, gentlemen, for all your hard work on this. Uh, Mr. Boehner, I know how, how long and hard you've worked on it as well as the rest of you. And so uh, I think we're as close as we're ever going to be, and I'm looking forward to getting this behind us. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Slaughter. You know, we're going to deliberate, Rob, on this issue. That's what this body is for. And we, we're we going to take the time to do it properly. And, you know, this body held up uh, Charlie for a couple hours tonight already trying to ask questions. And I thought that that was extraordinary for him to show up when he didn't even have his amendment uh, before the committee. But we are going to take the time, and we are going to be able to ask the questions. And that's what the floor is all about. And we're going to try and be be fair about this thing and give everybody a chance. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hastings. And if witnesses come here and don't have all the necessary preparation, I'm, well, I'm, I'm confused by my yeah. colleagues. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think you should be confused at all. We were not discussing his amendment. He chose out of his graciousness and his heart to come here with the other gentlemen about theirs, which is going to be the base text. Or we've been led to believe that Mr. Gansky is going to be the base text. And he came in here uh, and, and, uh, and, and was polite and answered all the questions. Uh, he fully admitted he didn't have his ready. Nobody tried to fool somebody. It wasn't like we had the words and somebody didn't. Nobody has it. 
deal that was cut tonight, it's pretty obvious to everybody, and, and that then we will have to deliver it. But it is not a requirement, as best as I know, that you have to be here to testify to get your amendment made in order. It does help me to understand when persons are proposing something as critical a change as this is, um, uh, that they take the point uh, and allow for people to um, ask uh, questions. I thought that was a part of the responsibility that I came here to undertake, but perhaps I'll change to Mr. Boehner. No, sir. And ask it, not, please, I have the time if you don't mind. Um, I, I'd like to ask Mr. Uh, Boehner, you, you indicated in uh, your opening statement that the outline that you reviewed gave you calls for optimism. Could you share that outline with us? What outline did you review? Uh, I saw the, uh, the same outline of the principles of the proposal that you have. And uh, it gives me reason for optimism. And as I said uh, during my testimony, uh, I'll reserve judgment on, final judgment on, on the proposed amendment until I see the actual language. So two lines in the class action limitation dealing with ERISA. Um, among the things of, of, with the Committee of Jurisdiction that you have responsibility to that led you to be optimist. I think the class action limitation. Uh, I think the fact that uh, uh, there's clear designated decision maker language in this bill uh, that will assign liability uh, to make it very clear who and who is liable, I think is a step in the right direction. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that uh, uh, the, their arrangement uh, where uh, some of this is dealt with in federal court uh, but does not step on state uh, right of actions under a federal scheme, I think is creative. It it's appears elsewhere in the law. Uh, in the retirement uh, or in the Railroad uh, uh, Transportation Act, uh, you see a similar scheme. You also see a similar scheme uh, that occurs in the Securities and Exchange uh, Act. And so uh, I, I think this is an effort on the part of the President uh, to try to find some common ground uh, with those uh, who are far to the left of me. Now, you can all imagine that if I were writing this language, it would be nowhere close to this. I think the remedies in the current law are sufficient. And, uh, but in an effort uh, to try to find some common ground with the other parties involved and a majority of the members, uh, I've reached out, and I think the President's reaching out, and I have reason for optimism. Thank you very much. That's all I have, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Can I ask one more question, if I may? I, because, you know, you brought the designated decision maker, and I'm not really clear. Um, is that person to be an employee? of the firm that makes that decision? Uh, well, we're what they're attempting to do there is to make clear uh, who will hold the liability, uh -huh. uh, and whether it's the employer or whether the employer may assign it to one of their third-party administrators, uh, an HMO, an insurance company. It could be anybody. It could be anybody. Who will have, hold the liability. Or if I might, I think the answer to that question is we don't know yeah. what the designated decision maker means because there is no proposal, there is no text, there is no definition. Now, I, there's through some mystical process, we're going to find this out in the next six hours or 12 hours or 18 hours, but we don't know. Well, the gentleman yield. Now, the gentleman uh, from New Jersey and I have discussed this issue for hours and hours and weeks and weeks last year in a conference between the House and Senate. Uh, on the patient's bill of rights. Now, uh, yes, this could vary somewhat from the debate that we had for months uh, over in Senator Nichols' office with Senator Kennedy and, else, and others, uh, but I think most of us who've worked on this have a very clear idea of what the designated decision maker language is. I remember being the person bringing it to the conference, having it rejected for several weeks, until they saw the wisdom of it, and they decided that it's a good idea. But the gentleman from New Jersey, the gentleman from New Jersey has a pretty clear idea what it is. I don't. I, I want to know if, if this is a person who is an employee of the company or chosen by the company. We could assume their loyalty is to the company. What? Uh, under, uh, let me finish this, Mr. Mender, if I may. The, the sponsoring entity, mm -hmm. the sponsor of the plan, uh, has a fiduciary duty. Mm -hmm. uh, up front, they have the liability. 
Uh, but, uh, but because there's no way to really carve out employers from this, these additional remedies as outlined in the base text or, for that matter, in the proposal that we, we may see from Mr. Norwood, uh, there was concern that we wanted to carve employers out. We want to punish those big bad insurance companies, but we want to take care of employers who happen to pay the bill. So all the and so the designated decision maker was a way of assigning liability. Actually, to determine benefits, is that correct? No, that's, that has nothing it's to not do. Correct. It has nothing to do with benefits. It only, it, it only refers to the assignment of who will be liable in case someone makes a mistake. Mm -hmm. And that could be the employer could, it, could keep it. Mm -hmm the sponsoring entity, or it could be an insurance company, HMO, or a third-party administrator. And they have a tremendous amount of power. Responsibility. Responsibility. Which, but if, power. I, if I may, that, that's another point about the, the truncated time frame in which these decisions are being made away from public view. Um, you know, if there aren't capitalization standards, if there aren't financial responsibility standards for this designated decision makers, Someone could contract out of the liability that might be imposed under this proposal. You can assign your liability to someone who has no assets, right. in which case no judgment could I be mean, recovered. There's a great difference between having sole liability and no liability. Yeah, these I mean, these are that, very complex questions that I don't think can be drafted yeah. in six or seven hours, which is what we're looking at right now. Okay. I, they were sort of hanging out there with, it seemed to me, somebody with enormous power, and I wondered about the asset issue because there's nothing in there, I assume. Of course, as you point out, we've not seen it. It, it really spells out what their obligations are and, and, and what kind of liability they should be responsible for, to what amounts. Thank you. That's all. I want to thank the panel very much. I, I appreciate uh, your understanding. This is a 724 committee, and we appreciate you making yourself available. Uh, we. Uh, well, we keep the sunshine on all the time here. We have the cameras going, the public are aware of what's going on, the nation's business is being done, and this is very helpful because we're explaining a very complicated subject. Thank you Five minutes, I'll be asleep. Sorry that you have to be here. Well, let's, uh, <laughs> we hope you'll have a useful cool. nap before we wake you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, without objection, uh, the gentleman from Texas's statement will be accepted for the record. Uh, at this time, I am advised we have a panel of uh, distinguished gentlemen from Kentucky, Dr. Ernie Fletcher, and distinguished gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Peterson, Colin Peterson. Um, Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And Good evening, Dr. Fletcher. Welcome to the committee. If you have a prepared statement, we would be happy without objection to accept it into the record, and we would welcome your comments, uh, abbreviated or otherwise. Well, let me uh, make some abbreviated uh, statements opening up. Actually, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the Rules Committee. Appreciate your diligence in uh, working these extended hours. Uh, first, let me say I commend Mr. Norwood and his negotiations with the President I think there have been some other negotiations that have gone on, and I, I know in a previous panel, uh, Mr. Gansky and Mr. Dingle mentioned that they had negotiated with the president and made an offer to him. And actually, when you look at that offer in their previous bill, they had totally exempted, fully insured, or correction, self insured, self administered plans from any liability, and they came back realizing that that they were so kind to say we'll put that liability in federal court and offer that as an alternative to the president to correct a, an oversight they had in their bill that was due to a, a, an amendment in uh, the Senate that was done very hastily, uh, I might add. But we're here tonight, and I'm here with a colleague from uh, Minnesota, Mr. Peterson. We have three amendments, and uh, we're going to go through, let me go through the substitute bill and two portions of that are offered in the other amendment, so I think we can cover all three amendments by going briefly through the substitute and save you all some time. Uh, considering the fact that uh, if, in fact, as we hope, Mr. Norwood's uh, language is uh, agreed upon and offered as amendment, we would certainly uh, like to see that offered as an amendment to the base bill on uh, Gans Gansky-Dingle-Norwood uh, bill. 
Our bill is offered. It was uh, basically a bill that was 2315. We offered uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2563, as it's been amended and, and offered here. Uh, this bill it was based upon uh, three principles: quality of care, access, and accountability of HMOs. It provides basically the same patient protection as the Gansky Dingle bill. It additionally provides internal and external review, provides a, a very high standards on external review, totally independent, allows them to operate completely independent of the insurance company or the employer, uh, sets the standards very high. We hinge liability around the exhaustion of that review. If injury occurs before uh, external review or if there's not ordinary care, then those causes of action will be heard in federal court with no limit on economic damages, 500,000 on non-economic damages, no punitives. If, however, the plan refused to comply with the external reviews decision, we basically remove the risk exemption, allow them to go to state court as any physician would be liable. And we do not, as in the Gansky Dingle bill, uh, try to write 19 pages of federal mandates on state causes of action. We simply remove the exemption, allow them to go to state according to the state rules, as I think Mr. Rob Andrews mentioned, with a, a number of years uh, of court law that has been established for the rules. Uh, we additionally provide some access provisions. Uh, those uh, include association health plans and uh, MSAs. Now, let me say this, this bill has been reviewed. I think everyone's familiar with it. It has the language of dedicated decision maker. Any question as to that uh, should not exist here in this committee. Both bills have designated decision maker. It will be some form of those that will be in the Norwood Dingle bill. So anyone that doesn't understand uh, dedicated decision maker and needs more time, they've had adequate time that's been in both bills for a number of months, uh, uh, considering that it was offered in the, the Senate as an amendment as well. Let me uh, close with that and, and uh, defer to my colleague from Minnesota, Mr. Peterson. Peterson. We're happy to have you. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, it's late, so I don't want to take a lot of time. I just uh, wanted to say, um, or maybe explain that um, I think I'm right about this. I should have checked this out. But uh, I believe I was the first member to introduce a patient protection bill in the House back in 1991 or two, uh, along with the AMA. So, uh, and that bill didn't look like anything like anything we're working on here today, <laughs> let me tell you. <clears throat> so I've had an interest in this in a, a long time. And frankly, to be honest about what's going on here, a lot of what we've been arguing about over these last number of years and clearly are <clears throat> arguing about today, uh, the world has passed us by, you know. And let's just be honest. I mean, the states have done a lot of this stuff, and you know, we should have done this eight years ago, nine years ago, whenever I introduced that bill. And uh, what the reason that I decided to join up with Mr. Fletcher is that I want to get this thing done. And my involvement in this has been to try to provide a constructive uh, voice on the other side of the aisle to try to see if I could get some of my colleagues to join me to uh, get this thing resolved before we wait another two years and we can just burn all the paper and, uh, and go home. And I think uh, Dr. Fletcher and the others that have worked on this have, have come up with a uh, answer to some of the uh, issues that I was concerned about uh, that you've heard about earlier that we're going to increase costs, we're going to probably make more people uh, uninsured, uh, I think, with the, with the base bill. And uh, I think we've come up with a way to address the liability issue. We've uh, come up with a way to provide some more access. And uh, from what I've seen of the uh, uh, compromise that was worked out with the President and Mr. Norwood today, um, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm trying to be helpful to get us to a place where we can pass a bill, we can get the bill signed, and we can get this behind us. And uh, frankly, uh, I'm one of those that was not really for any of this stuff the way that it's been put together, and I'm kind of like Mr. Boehner. I'm coming to this from the other direction, uh, um, agreeing to some things that I would probably go further than I would like to go, but I think we need to get this resolved. So um, I would hope that you would uh, uh, 
consider making these amendments in order and uh, hopefully the language that comes forward out of the uh, compromise that was worked out today and we can and I don't think we need to wait I think we know what's in here we uh, if we wait we're just going to keep turning the water for I don't know how long and uh, so I would just encourage you to I don't want to say that you guys should be here all night but uh, you're probably going to have to be and get you know get this language before you figure out uh, what's in it and uh, get this show on the road so uh, well that's our goal yeah. and you've uh, outlined it very well and you've set forth probably what we're going to be facing this evening so we appreciate that thank you for being here Mr. Doss oh, I just want to thank you both very much you uh, I took a shot at something very close to what you uh, are uh, proposing tonight last year and I hope you have better luck with it we than bar I did. a lot of your lines <laughs> I am delighted you did and I hope it works this time because I'd like to have it happen too Mr. Frost Dr. Fletcher I'm not sure I understood what you said are, are you asking that your uh, bill still be made in order or are you abandoning your bill and saying just go with the uh, the Norwood uh, agreement with the president uh, right now we're presenting all these amendments for the uh, committee to consider and uh, what I have said is that uh, I would be in support given the principles that uh, Mr. Nor or Dr. Norwood and the president have agreed to we've reviewed those and, and spoken to the president and Mr. Norwood as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I would say that I would ask the committee, if, if that language is worked out, that we do consider that in order, and I would be willing uh, tomorrow, if these are considered in order, to withdraw them. Uh, and I would, uh, to my friend Colin Peterson, I would only point out, mention something, I don't know if you were here when I brought this up earlier, that my own personal experience back during my first term, uh, I was the author of a particular provision, worked out with several several other members, and um, it was given to the committee staff, not the Rules Committee staff, to work on, and it uh, came back very different from what I, the agreement that we had entered into, and so fortunately I had been advised uh, by some senior members, more experienced members, to look very closely at the product of the, dra the people who were drafting the bill from that particular committee, and uh, it didn't, it wasn't exactly the way it was supposed to, it was very different, and we were able to correct that. So it is important to view the actual language. Absolutely. We can't, we I, can't I take things on trust around here. My, my hearing the discussion earlier, I, I don't think anybody here disagrees. I mean, as Absolutely. I understand it, the language is going to be there, you're going to look at it. Uh, I just don't think that you need hours or days to look at it. I mean, I think we all know what this stuff is, and it's going to be pretty close to things that we've seen before, and... It, presumably it will be, but uh, we do need that time. Well, and I don't, think, I don't think we're going to be here all night. Presumably we will hear some more witnesses and then uh, take a break and come back tomorrow morning at some point when we actually have language. We don't know when we're going to be getting the language. We hope that uh, we'll be able to follow that great encouragement we just got from you, Mr. Peterson. Appreciate it. Mr. Lender. hadn't been for the work that you've done, we wouldn't be at the point we're at this evening. You gave the president something that he could embrace, and it brought it together closer, and uh, you deserve a lot of credit, and I thank you. Uh, Mrs. Slaughter, Ms. Price. Thank you. I think you're both heroes, too. Uh, I agree with John. We wouldn't be here tonight except for the work you did together uh, across the aisle. And so um, thank you for that. I think we're going to have a product. We've never been closer, and um, we need to stay here till we get it done. Thanks. Mr. Hastings. No questions, Mr. Chair. Mr. Sessions. No questions. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate your uh, testimony and look forward to consideration of the uh, bill on the floor. We're happy now to be... Uh, Joined by the chairman of the uh, Committee on Ways and Means, uh, Mr. Thomas, and uh, welcome. We're pleased to have you, Mr. Chairman. I see that there are other members of your committee who are, are listed here, have been met, Mr. Portman, uh, Mr. Collins, Ms. Johnson, Mr. Pomeroy. No, what? Well, I understand that. I just am okay. stating that there are members of this committee uh, who are here. Uh, let me uh, say, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you uh, would like to uh, begin, we uh, will take your prepared statement without objection and include it in the record, and we will uh, welcome a summary. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm here on two particular amendments. Uh, the first one uh, would be the uh, malpractice amendment. Uh, the medical malpractice amendment is uh, offered by myself, a uh, gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner, Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Mr. Boehner, uh, Mr. Cox, Mr. Greenwood, uh, uh, the, uh, and uh, Mr. Tozan, uh, all of the uh, relevant committees of uh, jurisdiction. This particular medical malpractice provision is one uh, that I believe uh, will and should get uh, overwhelming support because it's a medical malpractice provision which simply fits in in those states that have no provisions or where uh, their particular state uh, does not have a structure uh, that encourages a speedy resolution of claims. Um, that is, if a state has enacted a medical malpractice law, then this law would not apply. It would be a federal law available only to those states that don't have the provisions, and if a state chooses at some time in the future uh, to uh, address those uh, provisions the way the state sees fit, then the federal portion will no longer apply. So in essence, it fills in the gaps. It uses the California structure, uh, commonly known as MICRA, in terms of uh, the limits, which is uh, $250,000. I do think it's relevant, uh, based upon all of the discussions by various groups, uh, as to whether medical malpractice uh, would be a plus or a minus in this particular package. I find it interesting that in, uh, uh, on April 24th, uh, in front of the Committee on Ways and Means, uh, Dr. Richard Corlin, who's the AMA president-elect, indicated that uh, uh, under circumstances, particularly in the non-economic damages area, which are very, very subjective, he said, the cost of maintaining the assurance, which is a legal requirement, has driven people out of practice and reduced access to care in certain areas and increased the costs as those costs are passed along to end users, the idea of having to practice defensive medicine, but most importantly, paying the extremely high premiums to protect themselves from uh, uh, suits. American Hospital Association said it uh, much more succinctly in a letter to me, uh, June 14th of this year, uh, quote, I am writing to offer our strong support for including meaningful health care liability reforms as part of any patient's Bill of Rights protection. And if you allow me just one more, because this was in a letter to President Bush, the American College of Surgeons, um, and I think this is particularly relevant based upon what we're planning on doing in this particular package. It says, if the Congress and your administration seriously entertain caps on punitive and non-economic damages, we believe it would be difficult, if not impossible, to explain why federal policymakers did not at the same time address the liability exposure addressed by physicians, hospitals, and other healthcare practitioners and providers. It would be unfair, they say, to enact a patient's bill of rights that caps damages for suits against health plans without capping damages for suits brought against physicians and other healthcare providers. I think that pretty well sums it up. We're not trying to dictate a one-size-fits-all. We're providing an opportunity where there are gaps in the nation structure to fit this federal plan, and when a state chooses to move, it would be the state's structure uh, that would be in place instead of this one. Uh, that's the sum and substance of the bill. Do you want to talk about the other one? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, the next one, uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Fletcher, uh, and uh, Sam Johnson, uh, uh, who is a member of both the Ways and Means Committee uh, uh, and um, uh, the Labor uh, Committee, and in fact, the subcommittee chairman, and uh, Mr. Lipinski of Illinois, who has been a, a long working partner uh, uh, with me uh, in uh, continuing uh, the good work of the former chairman of the committee, uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Archer. Uh, this provision, uh, this amendment would include two provisions that were in, uh, are in the Fletcher bill dealing with access. Uh, we know that we have in place a um, program for utilizing um, medical savings accounts, which uh, has not been as successful as we would like because it's not permanent. And in discussing with people who in the real world write insurance, uh, they say that it's very difficult to uh, write policies for uh, those structures and organizations uh, who don't believe there's a permanency to the insurance uh, that you're offering. In addition to that, 
it hasn't been written as a realistic insurance plan. That is, the employer is not allowed to contribute along with the employee. Uh, they're not allowed to build the money up to a level of 100% of liability. It just has been uh, a structure that isn't workable. The modest changes uh, in the uh, medical savings account provisions, we believe, uh, make this a, a viable insurance product. And let me, for the record, indicate that a poll uh, that was just taken, July 26th through July 29th, of uh, 1,006 Americans uh, indicated that 81% of all the respondents believed employers should have the option of offering their employees a medical savings account. 9% uh, disagree. What's significant is that 91% of those respondents uh, between the ages of 18 and 29 uh, agreed. And of course, the whole concept of a medical savings account is to bet on your uh, ability to keep yourself healthy so that you don't use up the money in a given year and you're able to roll it over to become more self-insured. Uh, it makes sense that the younger people uh, see this as an opportunity to invest in their own uh, good health. Uh, and just as interestingly, if you want to break it down from um, a registered uh, uh, party point of view, 84% of the Republicans, 80% of the Democrats, and 77% of those who identified themselves as independents were in favor of it. And then if you want to break it down uh, on an ethnic racial basis, 81% of the whites, 79.6% of the Hispanics, and 84% of the African Americans uh, also agreed uh, that Americans should have the option of choosing a, a medical savings account. That's one of the provisions uh, in uh, this amendment. The other one uh, is an uh, area that's been uh, evolving, and the name has changed, but we're now calling them uh, uh, AHPs, which are American Health uh, Plans, uh, Associated Health Plans. They used to be MIWAs in the old days. Uh, and uh, the gentleman from Kentucky who has been working in this area, and it's his committee's responsibility, uh, will explain that area. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We would worked, and I know you may uh, recall last year, Mr. Talent had worked on the Association Health Plan bill. We have a bill we filed made some changes and I, I, I believe some improvements. It was the Small Business Fairness Act. This portion of the legislation included in our base bill we talked about as well as this amendment allows the same opportunity for small businesses that exist for large businesses. This will allow organizations like the Farm Bureau, the Chamber of Commerce, National Federation of Independent Businesses to offer a national health plan, self-insured, possibly self-administered, which would allow folks to pool all across the nation, reducing the health care cost in small businesses 10 to 30 percent. When you consider we have 43 million people uninsured, and of the working uninsured, 60 percent in small businesses, this gives them the opportunity to provide insurance to their employees. Uh, additionally, in Kentucky, I've got farmers that are paying anywhere from eight to nine hundred dollars for a family policy. This would allow them to get into group policy because of our health care reform that did not take into account some unintended consequences, we basically destroyed the individual market and this will help tremendously. There are plenty of uh, reserve requirements, very similar to we have those requirements on the designated decision maker, which were brought up early, which are very well covered. These are also covered to make sure these plans do not leave any patients uh, high and dry. Uh, we have the same requirements that are established by the labor. It's voluntary. Unions are not affected. They may join it if they want to, but it does not affect union multi-employer plans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fletcher. Let me uh, just raise a couple of comments before we get to the amendments of the other gentlemen. We're going to uh, go through there. I uh, am particularly pleased with this whole MSA access question. I was just remembering as you were testifying uh, back in 1987, actually, I introduced legislation calling for the establishment of medical savings accounts. Uh, so 14 years ago, we began this. I worked with a guy called Peter Farrar, who was uh, putting together the, some of the early proposals on, on uh, MSAs. And, uh, and Vince Randazzo, who's sitting right behind me here, actually did that when we were way back in the minority. And we ended up with the 390,000 uh, MSAs that were established out there and uh, we've I think had quite a bit of success and the idea and the, the, the encouraging news of course Mr. Thomas is the idea of, of seeing people in the age block of 18 to 29 now focusing on this is something that we thought might happen and early on there were a number of people who were 
concerned about it and that no, we've just groups who are now yeah. classified as exactly insured. exactly and uh, this is i think uh, the access component to this bill is something that i think is playing a big role in attracting a lot of us to uh, be enthusiastic uh, backers of this i'd like to uh, i know that mr collins is here member of your committee to uh, raise an issue he's he's got an amendment that he uh, would like this committee to make an order and i just wondered if you had any comments at all about the amendment that uh, mr collins is going to be proposing to us if you'd like him to proceed uh, and then you can comment That's fine. On i just indicate to you that uh, chairman is uh, in support of the two amendments uh, that he's presenting on behalf of the committee mm -hmm. and um, i'm not in support of any other amendments that may be presented mm -hmm. that would be it would have an effect on this that have the jurisdiction yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if we want to, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know what your schedule is, uh, Mr. Thomas, if you'd like to. I'd really like to find out if there are any questions so that uh, Good. they'll get ready for the Mr. next. Mr. Goss? I have no questions. Mr. Slaughter? Mr. Linder? Questions. Mr. Hastings? Yes, I do have a question, Mr. Um, Chairman, and uh, then I would ask for a response mm -hmm. of, of uh, 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 in another variety from uh, Mr. Pomeroy. Mr. Pomeroy, having been a former insurance commissioner, I'm pretty sure he has some views of, with reference to MSAs and AHPs, and I'd ask Please him. Please say we're going to take testimony from him in just a moment because we've just heard from these. Uh, All right, then perhaps I'll put my question to Mr. Thomas with the chairman's permission. Um, Mr. Thomas, in section 806 on page 6, under the general rule, read very clearly I may have a different version of the bill because yes I sir it's in the three in on page six it's it's your amendment um to NATO six yes sir okay and basically it says in the case of any health care lawsuit concerning the provision of health care goods or services in interstate commerce no civil monetary penalty may be awarded against the manufacturer of a medical product based on a claim that the medical product caused the claimant's harm if the medical product complies with FDA standards. Uh, it's my understanding that you're looking at um, an older version of the amendment. That's why I was reacting. Okay. Uh, section 806 is on page 17 of the All right. uh, new Is amendment. that language still there? Keep going so that I can find the section that you're in. 806, regardless of the page number. Yes, sir, is the language that I just recited. Is it still a part of uh, whatever the draft? It uh, applies okay. to punitive damages only. All right. That said, if the FDA then approves the product and subsequently learns that there are problems with the product. And let me give you the most recent example that you, I, and everybody knows about, and that's FinFin. What's the effect of uh, this provision of your amendment if that occurs? In short, the, uh, uh, they learn later, the FDA, that they made a mistake in approving something that has caused um, uh, damage to an individual. Do they have a right then to any monetary damages? The person harmed or persons harmed? Doc, you know the answer while he's looking at the answer. If I understand the question, it is directed to give that. If you're talking about a lawsuit of something like you said, Fin Fin, when you're talking about the class action suits, uh, mostly against uh, providers, I, I don't know how that would apply to, to health plans under association health plans under section 806. No, so this talks about the manufacturer of the product. Okay. My understanding is the product that you indicated was actually uh, a composition of two different drugs. All right, then. Manufactured by two different companies. Notwithstanding okay. that, if in fact something occurred, they would be able to have the economic damages or the non but not the punitive. So if a single product and this example exists as well, has been approved by FDA, and it moves in interstate commerce. And FDA later withdraws um, uh, the provision allowing uh, that the product had been in compliance. 
and in the interim, a person is uh, 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 damaged or victimized. How, do, how does this cover uh, liability, punitive or otherwise? Well, all the otherwise would be available. You could get uh, pain and suffering, you could get economic damages, you just, okay, wouldn't, just, you get just wouldn't get the punitive. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I'll raise this again uh, when you have the amendment on the floor because I'm not clear that uh, right. uh, about it at all. And it might be useful uh, if, um, it, just so that we could look at the circumstances, if we could uh, search together or I'll have staff look to find an actual uh, product. It's right. always more useful to do that than a hypothetical. I understand. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Linder. Oh, Mr. Price. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much for being here, gentlemen. And now we'd uh, like to hear from uh, Mr. Collins and Mr. Pomeroy. And Chairman, I would request that the Chairman of the Ways and Means wait until we present our amendment before he begins opposition to it. Uh, I would like to know why. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the amendment that the Collins Pomeroy uh, put together uh, amends the Social Security Act to clarify the definition of coordination of benefits to see that the ERISA plans adhere to the same regulations of non ERISA plans when it comes to coordination of benefits so that those who buy plans outside of the employment receive the benefits of the plan that they purchase based on the premiums they pay. And that's basically where we are. And I yield to Mr. Pomeroy. He is a former commissioner of insurance and president of the National right. Association of Insurance. Thank you, here. Thank, you very much. thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank my friend, Mr. Collins, for advancing this amendment and uh, allowing me to participate in its sponsorship. What we certainly don't want to happen is coordination of benefits in a way that would take away from an employee extra health insurance coverages that they might choose to carry on themselves provided that those extra benefits are in the nature of supplemental policies. For example, you can buy yourself a hospital indemnity policy, uh, pay a small amount per day, premium's pretty cheap. And the role of it in your own risk management plan is if you go in uh, and get your employer coverage and all, you still will have the deductible, you'll still have the co-play. And many have found that these hospital indemnity policies come in and take that kind of impact uh, off of the insured. Now, without the language of the Collins-Pomeroy Amendment, we have the situation where an employer can actually coordinate benefits against that supplemental policy. In other words, reduce the claims payment that they would make under the employer-based policy to the extent that there's any additional coverage out there. To prevent this from happening, state insurance commissioners have developed a very carefully uh, crafted coordination of benefits plan that, that while it coordinates benefits for those families having two or more major medical benefits, does not take away from an individual the benefits of their health supplemental policies. That, of course, because it is state crafted, state enacted, applies to the private market, it does not apply to the self-insured market. Now, why is this an issue now? With the HIPAA legislation, we have a dimension of uh, a computer, uh, computerized uh, capture of all coverage information to a degree we've never had before. And so I believe without this amendment, you have the very real prospect of employers deciding to take away from the individual the benefit of their health supplemental coverage. Is there a downside to this? I don't see one. I view it as a consumer protection amendment that all should be able to agree. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have on it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, uh, I don't know, uh, Mr. Thomas, if you would like to. Uh, if you'd like to, please. Because uh, notwithstanding the fact that we have the Social Security jurisdiction, this is primarily uh, an ERISA issue uh, in Ed and Labor, and they are the primary uh, committee of jurisdiction. Uh, my only concern would be that we're dealing with a national uniform standard that has been created by HIPAA, and this legislation basically wants to take the state model and put it into uh, that structure for ERISA 
notwithstanding the federal law that's in place, uh, this administration has said that they're going to uh, look at that area and continue to move forward. Not saying that at this time that this isn't or it might not be an appropriate uh, decision to make. Uh, I think that actually the administration should go forward and take a look at this, that it, this is not the only vehicle, if you will, in which we could address this, and that given the concerns that we have on this particular legislation, um, I might even want to uh, hold a hearing in terms of uh, HIPAA itself or other areas of HIPAA that we've begun to see, notwithstanding our best efforts to try to na create a national uniform standard, that in this particular area and perhaps in others, uh, re-examining that might be worthwhile. Um, so I'm not saying that I'm prejudicing the subject matter of the amendment. Uh, I think time, place, and manner uh, is the question that I would put forward. But uh, obviously, since it affects ERISA, I would think that the Educational Labor Committee ought to be consulted as well. Mr. Chairman, if I might briefly respond. In, in the nature, uh, by the way, first of all, let me acknowledge the profound respect I have for the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee and his long work and considerable expertise in health policy issues, including fairly minutiae and technical matters of health insurance. I worked with him when I was an insurance commissioner, and it's indeed a pleasure for me now to work with him as a member of his committee. Uh, have, oftentimes mutual. <laughs> oftentimes. <laughs> uh, in terms of time, place, and manner relative to the consideration of new uh, items, this is an easy one. This is really an easy one. If you've got a health supplemental policy, you ought to be uh, allowed to, to get, collect the benefit of it, uh, not pay premiums for something that the employer can then just reduce his medical claims by a commensurate amount. This is an easy one. Uh, in fact, the chairman has advanced pretty significant new issues uh, for uh, consideration in the context of the base bill, uh, or as amendments to the base bill, including very significant medical malpractice reform, wholly new coverage issues like the MSAs, which are essentially an unregulated, um, or not, not, not MSAs, the, the AHPs, or the, the old MEWAs, the, these self and the association health, health plans, the, the, these, uh, uh, these uh, virtually unregulated association uh, type coverages that, that uh, while we uh, may have reputable entities eager to provide coverage under those, what, what I saw as an insurance commissioner is there an awful lot of scru uh, 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 skullduggery uh, and, uh, and, and scrupulous operators hoping to defraud small employers that do not have the in-house expertise to evaluate issues like solvency, inadequate reserving, inadequacy of premium, that will use that kind of AHP arrangement to frankly rip off small employ employers. So in my opinion, if you're going to look at additional matters, this is an easy one. The things that the chairman has spoken to are much more difficult, much more complex, and uh, therefore, uh, without uh, opining on whether or not you uh, allow the chairman's, I'd like you to allow uh, Congressman Collins and my little bitty uh, totally good public policy amendment. Well, let me just say that uh, I, I appreciate your arguments. I think that uh, Mr. Thomas has made a, a compelling case as chairman of the Ways and Means Committee that. He uh, believes that there are some very, very uh, good reasons to proceed with this idea, but he believes that this legislation is not the uh, appropriate time or place for us to, to pursue it. And I uh, clearly Mr. have Chairman, a let me say also that, that. Uh, the record will show that uh, my position was solicited. I didn't volunteer it. Mm -hmm. uh, I was asked. And uh, if I were to require uh, to present to you written material, my written material would contain in it somewhere that I would uh, request that the Rules Committee offer an appropriate rule. Uh, and Use that term on occasion. Uh, and uh, in this matter, uh, I would also indicate that I would hope that the Rules Committee would uh, offer an appropriate rule. Mr. Chairman, if I may make one, one, one final quick response. This committee does not consider ERISA amendments relative to health coverage often. This is without question germane to the base bill, germane to the amendments uh, you, are, uh, you are also considering. I believe if we miss this opportunity, we won't quickly have another opportunity. And so uh, in light of the very finite nature of what we're trying to address here, the fact that this has been thoroughly vetted by the state insurance commissioners, the nation's experts in these regulatory matters, and applied consistently of longstanding relative to the private market, 
it is also time we expand this protection, and it is a clear consumer protection, making sure the employee gets the full benefit of the health coverages they have in place, the health coverages of the employer, the health coverage they themselves carry, in addition to supplement their, their out-of-pocket exposure under the employer plan. And now is the time, now is the place. Thank Let's you very do much. it. And Mr. Goss, no, you made it very clear. Mr. Slaughter. Mr. Lender. Isn't it true, Mr. Pomeroy, that all of these policies are individually purchased by the consumer who wants additional coverage to make up for losses that they might have? That, that is absolutely correct. And it's a, these are already people insured. These are not uninsured people. Well, actually, you know, it, it's, this policy may be sold to those with coverage. It may be sold to those without coverage. But uh, in, in, in any event, it is usually, you, you don't, I don't think you have the situation of an employer putting in place uh, a major medical and then offering a health supplemental. So it is an individual electing the health supplemental in addition. 99% of them are individual purchasers. That's correct. For paying out of their own pocket. Absolutely. For benefits that they deserve. And it's unfair the employer to decide, now that I know you've got it, I'd like to have it myself. That's correct. Thank you. That's basically what's happening here. This is a consumer protection <coughs> measure for those who purchase insurance with their own hard-earned money. There are regulations proposed right now before the Health and Human Services that will be coming out very shortly that will jeopardize these benefits, jeopardize these by having some unscrupulous employer somewhere who through the electronic filing will be able to pick these funds up and apply them to theirs rather than the individual getting the the premium or the benefits of the premiums they paid. This is the time to do it. I have talked to the chairman about this a week or so ago. I, we ran this by the labor and education people, by Mr. Boehner. Uh, this is not a, something new that just cropped up here tonight. And I did solicit your and disappointed uh, with it. Mr. Pomeroy and Mr. Collins, I'd ask earlier that Mr. Uh, Pomeroy be given an opportunity, and I'd ask him, please, in the interest of everybody's time, if you could give us just a brief analysis of uh, the import of uh, medical saving accounts and associated health plans. Well, there's great concern within the uh, health insurance community that medical savings accounts may have the effect of uh, uh, changing the characteristics of the risk pool. In order to have insurance work, you got, a, you got all kinds of risks blended together. And if medical savings accounts are part of the option, you have those less likely to have uh, health incidents, uh, those that are younger, inevitably, in an employer plan, electing the MSA option. Now, that makes everybody else an older, potentially more sicker pool, and premiums begin to drive upward on that, driving more out. And it, it, it's, a, it's a destabilizing uh, element in terms of keeping uh, a, a broad risk pool so that all have coverage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I could respond these, briefly. Oftentimes these people buy this insurance because their health insurance is actually for that health situation to pay those health bills. These funds are extra funds that can help them pay bills at home beyond what they have for the health coverage. So th this is very important to the consumer who pays their own premium, buys this insurance, that they receive the benefits of their policy. And this is a time to do it while we're dealing with the ERISA plans to make sure that ERISA comes under the same regulations that non-ERISA plans do. Just a brief response in terms of that exchange, because that is the classic uh, criticism to a certain extent. Uh, I found it interesting that 71% of those 65 and over also were interested in it. And uh, to make sure that this becomes more of a broad-based insurance policy and not a narrow one, uh, what that amendment also does is that it begins to blend a medical savings account with other more classical insurance packages. For example, on a PPO, where they may have uh, preventive benefits as part of the package, uh, historically the MSAs wouldn't fit. Uh, the amendment that we're talking about allows plans to cover the first dollar for preventive benefits without going into that structure so they could actually join a PPO
for the purpose of the health care structure, but still get the preventive benefits as well. So to the degree that this concept, the idea of someone controlling their own money spent for those provisions they believe are important for them health-wise, but still having it convertible enough to begin to blend into more, blend into more traditional health plans makes it less of uh, that selective structure for particular people. And the key here uh, is to create a structure which gives an opportunity for those who do not now have insurance, don't see it as a reasonable or rational package. The idea that it's somehow distorting an insurance pool when these people aren't in the insurance pool to begin with is, I think, a stretch. If, in fact, we pick up new people with this, what we're doing is providing insurance for people who weren't previously covered. There was a reason why they weren't getting in the pool in the first place. They either couldn't afford it or it didn't seem a bargain for them. This makes sense to them. We, in fact, expand the insurance pool. And that's another argument that I think we're trying to drive. I'm sure Mr. Palmer might have a response because his, I would think, is based on being an insurance commissioner of the state of, uh, uh, that he was in and not just on his views here in Congress. I hope Congress I'm correct. Say, in, in, in fairness to the chairman, actually, the MSA concept wasn't really in existence during the time I was an insurance regulator. It's pretty in new North in our Dakota. experience. And we, 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 so, that, you know, that I can't claim experience. I can claim experience, however, on the uh, association health plans, which we knew in an earlier iteration as MEWAs, Multiple Employer Welfare Arrangements. You have problems with these because basically they allow small employers to kind of pitch in and and form a, 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 a group association to self-insure. Well, obviously, the small employers don't get together on the Kiwanis table and do it. You've got a promoter that gets everybody together. Uh, he, he basically allows these promoters to form insurance companies without cap adequate capitalization and without adequate regulatory oversight. The Department of Labor isn't staffed up to look over this, but they're not subject to state insurance regulation. What we have seen in a couple of different times, even before the multiple employer welfare arrangements, you had the multiple employer trusts. So we've tried this in all kinds of iterations, and in the end it just doesn't work because you don't have adequate capitalization and you don't have adequate regulatory oversight. Thank you. Uh, if I might respond to that just briefly. The reason I got involved was because there's an organization out in my area, I have a heavy agricultural area called the Western Growers Association. Uh, it is a, a major multi-state. Uh, California, Arizona. And what they were having difficulty, notwithstanding uh, wanting to help their employees, they have as a, a single grower not sufficient resources to provide the health insurance, but since they belong to a growers association, this structure would afford them the opportunity to provide health care to a number of agricultural workers who currently don't have it by pooling those resources and creating an association health plan. So although in the past there may have been, and to a possibility, no legislation cleans up unscrupulous folk, it has been structured over the years. The name change is not just to avoid the problems of the past, the structure has changed as well. And there are clear instances where, once again, without this structure, people will go without health insurance with this structure, we believe it'll be provided. It will expand the insurance pool. Thank you. The, the, the problem isn't just getting the coverage out there. It's making sure they have the resources to pay the claims right. when the claim is incurred. And that's been the problem with these things. I agree. <laughs> Ms. Price, I have however. no questions. Thank you. I'm just pleased to see we're talking about MSAs. The, pri prior to coming to Congress, I worked for the National Center for Policy Analysis, the NCPA, which John Goodman, Dr. John Goodman from Dallas, began this MSA concept and worked with Dr. Goodman. It's all his idea. It's a great concept, but I'm glad to see them take off the right way because I think they'll be successful for a lot of people. Yield back. Exactly. Uh, let me just say that I, I was just reminded by Vince here that it was uh, one of his articles that got us first enthusiastic about this back in 1987. I was talking earlier about the fact that we pursued this and the whole MSA concept is uh, one that I think has been successful and has tremendous potential and I'm most encouraged with the, the figures that we've gotten here. Well, thank you very much. Nice to have three, uh, the chairman of the committee and two of his distinguished uh, members here and hope we can come to a resolution on the question that we have had. Uh, next, uh, we're happy to welcome for his first appearance before the Committee on Rules at, uh, let's see, at exactly 1.30 and 15 seconds, the uh, successor to the former Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, Mr. Archer, Mr. Culbertson, and thank, thank you, you very much for your patience, and we appreciate your uh, 
hard work and uh, Thank you. the stellar service you've provided for the people of Houston. And we will, without objection, take uh, whatever prepared remarks you have and include them in their entirety, and we'll welcome a summary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, committee members. I will keep this brief. I am uh, compelled to appear before you tonight for the first time. I bring to you a amendment that uh, I have drafted with the assistance of the Congressional Legislative Council here. Uh, I bring it to you tonight on behalf of myself, uh, Mr. Deal, and uh, Mr. Duncan, as well as Mr. Thornberry, because uh, we want to address in a very straightforward and simple way one concern that's been raised by uh, members of Congress from both sides of the aisle that we not, in enacting the Patient Bill of Rights, that Congress not preempt the authority of the states to regulate the practice of medicine, to uh, regulate the licensing of uh, physicians. Uh, the uh, reason I ran for Congress was to ensure to protect the, the Tenth Amendment. Uh, I pledged to the people in my district I would always work to make sure Texans run Texas. That was the original campaign promise of Governor Bush when he was elected in 1994. Uh, and by way of quick background, uh, uh, I not only have a real passion for protecting the Tenth Amendment, but bring some personal experience to this as well. I was one of the uh, authors of the Texas Patient Bill of Rights in Texas in 1997. I helped uh, pass it through the Texas House. I served 14 years there in the Texas House and worked as the House Republican Whip. Also helped carry every uh, major piece of tort reform legislation that we passed in Texas. Helped Governor Bush pass his entire tort reform package in 1995 and have worked uh, zealously to ensure that the courthouse is the last resort uh, and that it is, however, available to people who are genuinely injured. So I'm, I'm very familiar with the Texas Patient Bill of Rights. Uh, with the ERISA laws, I work as, worked as a civil defense attorney in Houston uh, prior to my uh, being sworn in as a member of Congress on, on January 3rd. And as I read both the uh, uh, Fletcher bill as well as the Nor uh, Gansky uh, Norwood uh, Dingle uh, patient bill of rights, I was concerned that there was some preemption of the Texas patient bill of rights. Uh, that concern was shared by others uh, uh, in Texas. And so we drafted this amendment and I present it to you tonight. It is in a generic format. It would fit within the language of whatever form the final Norwood uh, amendment is presented to you. And it is, uh, it is very straightforward and written. Uh, I, I wrote it with the assistance of Texas Legislative Council, uh, Congressional Legislative Council. We've all gone over this carefully. And uh, it is designed to ensure that uh, nothing in the Patient Bill of Rights would uh, prevent a law like Texas, a state like Texas, uh, or California, or any other state in the Union, from enacting a law that uh, uh, would protect patients' rights, as it uh, and, and that would attempt to set standards for health care, treatment decisions, medical care, uh, the licensing or regulation of physicians. That's all clearly within the rights of the state. So we're really essentially just codifying current law, making that crystal clear, because of course the courts look to Congress's intent and the language of the statute when they're trying to determine what Congress means in uh, enacting a law like ERISA. Uh, and then finally, I've uh, made it clear that if it is, uh, is there are, if I could very quickly, obviously two types of lawsuits involved here, uh, and the reason this legislation is necessary at the federal level, the reason we had to pass it in Texas is because HMOs in, in, in many ways, uh, they are insurance carriers and uh, they are also at times doctors and they wear when they wear their hat as doctors the fifth circuit court of appeals in upholding the texas law the only state patient bill of rights to have been upheld by an appellate court as an exception from the erisa preemption the fifth circuit pointed out that when an insurance plan uh, operates as a puts on the hat as a medical care provider they are subject to regulation by the states under the tenth amendment uh, as a, as a health care provider. So I'm simply making that clear, lifted language out of the out of the Texas statute that's already been blessed by the Fifth Circuit, out of existing case law, and uh, so that as that those lawsuits involving medical liability, licensing of doctors, those will be governed by state law. Secondly, uh, this language makes it very clear that if it is a claim involving benefits or coverage, the uniform standard that we enact in the federal statute will apply, and those will be those claims will be determined by the Patient Bill of Rights enacted by Congress, as it should be, uniformly in all 50 states. And uh, then finally, I've added a section here, uh, retention of powers, to make it very clear. Again, just codifying in very plain, simple English 
existing law, and that is that the states retain their sovereign authority to regulate health care in each state. I think we are confident, all of us as authors of this amendment, that this will answer a lot of concerns by a lot of members that in enacting the final form of the Norwood bill that we're not preempting. Thank you very much, Mr. Culbertson. We appreciate that and your uh, very strong commitment to the Constitution, in this case the Tenth Amendment, as you've uh, liked to point out, is uh, appreciated, and I think you make a very, very uh, compelling case here. Thank you. Mr. Goss? I agree. That's a very uh, impressive uh, uh, array of uh, information you've given us and experience. Ms. Slaughter? Thank you. Ms. Slaughter? Questions? Thank you. Mr. Hastings? Uh, Mr. Ms. Bryce? No questions. Mr. Sessions? I appreciate the gentleman staying up till late <coughs> to get this done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I should note that uh, last night the Rules Committee adjourned uh, at about 24 hours ago um, at this exact moment. We adjourned, and we're happy to be here tonight. And we thank you very much for your testimony. Appreciate your uh, your joining us. And thank you. Forward to it's a privilege to be with you. The floor. Thank you very much. Great job in your first appearance. Our next witness is the, uh, I see we've got two, uh, Mr. La Tourette gentleman from Ohio, and are you joined by Mr. Kirk? Would the two of you like Not to? I'm happy to be with you. Why don't the two Mr. of you come Kirk up to the table here and <laughs> sort of, uh, before we recess, we'd like Back to hear from, from the, uh, well, we're just going to recess for a little while here and sort of get organized and see how things are going to go Hello, through Kirk. the evening. Please, go ahead, Mr. 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 Chairman, Mr. Kirk and I are honored to be in the others category uh, appearing before you this evening uh, early in the morning. <laughs> Uh, Actually, um, interestingly enough, there were a lot of other people in the others category, I should tell you. All of their names have been scratched out. I don't know if they testified or if they didn't show up. You may... I, I think it was attrition. A the, a it was attrition, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and might I indicate what a, a nice hearing room you have. I haven't been here in my seven years in Congress, but Mr. Traffigan, my uh, colleague from Ohio, has told me a lot about the room, and I'm honored to be here. This is your first appearance before the Rules Committee? It is. And, and, Gosh. And I want to tell you, at one time I wanted to serve. in the morning? I told you I wanted to, I, one time I asked the Speaker if I could serve on the Rules Committee, and after seeing what you have to go through, I never want to serve on the Rules <laughs> Committee. <laughs> I, I also want to apologize to the members of the committee. I was in the uh, chair presiding over the energy bill earlier in the House uh, and refereeing a debate between Texas and California, so I wasn't present when the white smoke came out of the chimney at the White House signaling the deal between Mr. Norwood, the Speaker, and the President. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I hope I don't uh, bore the members of the committee, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here. The, uh, I voted for uh, Norwood Dingle in last Congress. I'm an original co-sponsor of Gansky Dingle. Uh, but what occurred to me uh, during uh, the course of this, that there was a flaw in, in that legislation. And the flaw was that even if the plan did the right thing and the independent review indicated that they had been correct in the denial of coverage, the gansky dingle bill indicated that uh, they couldn't sue for punitive damages. And we used to call it a soup sandwich back in Ohio. That you bite into it, there's no substance. Because if you've done everything right, there's no punitive damages. But it still let, it you, let you sue for uh, non-economic damages, pain and sufferings, and things of that nature. That didn't seem right to me that you should still be able to go forward in that situation if you've done everything that you were supposed to do. Uh, and so uh, I thought about the House, and in the House on this issue, there are some people that would want you to sue if it was a Monday, because that's their predisposition. There are some people in the House that would want you never to have the opportunity to sue. And it occurred that perhaps we needed a middle ground. The amendment, to, and I realize that I'm a, a, a very small fish in a very large ocean, was an attempt to, to find the middle ground. And I looked to my experience as a former prosecuting attorney. I looked at cases in the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission situation where you had, before you could bring suit, you had to go before the EEOC and say you'd been discharged because of race, because of age, because of sex. Uh, and uh, I brought the figures with me and uh, ask uh, your permission, unanimous consent, to submit those into the record. And the way the vetting process works is you had to file a complaint or a claim with the EEOC, and if they found cause, you could then proceed uh, to lawsuit. And if, if you did not, if they said there was no cause, you could still sue, but you started in the hole. And, and the hole was that they shifted the burden, and you had to prove that there was a, a difficulty. So it was burden shifting, uh, and it was also presumption shifting. In the fiscal year 2000, there were approximately 80,000 cases uh, claiming some kind of discrimination before the EEOC. But when it went before the vetting process and people figured out that perhaps they didn't have the claim they thought they had, there were only 237 lawsuits actually filed out of 80,000 80, 80, claims. 
The amendment that I offer before, and I realize that I may be preempted by the agreement that's been reached at the White House this evening, uh, but if it's not uh, put into letter form that uh, is pleasing to everybody, would suggest that if the independent review panel uh, finds that the insurer was correct in denying coverage, that the plaintiff can still proceed the lawsuit, but they have to, one, there's a presumption that the independent review was correct, and the plaintiff must overcome that presumption by clear and convincing evidence. So we create a burden on the plaintiff, and we also, we not only shift the burden, we increase the level of proof from preponderance of the evidence to clear and convincing evidence. In my mind, that that's, finds the middle ground. Uh, it uh, permits people to still have their day in court, but it also recognizes that you can't just have a frivolous lawsuit for the purpose of having a frivolous lawsuit. And I thank you so much thank for the opportunity much, to be Mr. here. I appreciate your time and your thoughtful testimony. Mr. Kirk. Mr. Chairman, I'm uh, here other, but uh, uh, really coming from the Armed Services Committee, which just uh, completed its work, and uh, hope that you'll be supporting their uh, uh, legislation without amendment, since it is now in its perfect form, coming out of the full committee. Uh, but uh, with regard to the Patients' Bill of Rights, uh, while the Senate uh, uh, corrected one uh, item, uh, the House has uh, yet to consider that, and that is but while we're uh, extending coverage to civilians, uh, with an access to a second opinion or access to specialists, uh, we're not doing that so for men and women in uniform. Uh, this is particularly a concern to me because the uh, military operates one of the nation's largest HMOs called TRICARE. Uh, it covers 8.3 million Americans. And uh, this was corrected by the uh, Nichols Amendment in the Senate, uh, but it's not yet in uh, either draft of the Patients' Bill of Rights in the House. I think it's incumbent upon the House to make sure that when you put on the nation's uniform that you do not lose patient protections. And so I would uh, urge that uh, my amendment do that. Thank you very much. Mr. Johnson? Uh, that's still uh, very clear amendments. Mr. Lachrette, uh, I did want to ask you one little quick question about yours. Who pays court courts? court costs if, if somebody chooses, if the uh, defendant plaintiff chooses to go forward? It's not specifically mentioned in our amendment, but it would be typically if, if there is a frivolous lawsuit or the, the, the each party pays their own. There's no loser pays in my amendment. Thank you. Mrs. Slaughter. No, but these are two of my favorites, and so I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they've got great amendments. Mr. Linder. Thank you very much. Mr. Hastings. No questions, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Price. Mr. Sessions. I just applaud the gentleman from Ohio for what he's doing. You know, he saw, he's seen this battle going on for quite a long time. He's talked with me several times. And then he came up to me the other night and said he had good good remedy for it and uh, took the time to be here uh, with us, and I appreciate this very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We appreciate your being here. Let me say that uh, at this point, the, uh, the Rules Committee is uh, anticipating a work product on. from uh, Mr. Norwood and the others who are involved. And so the committee is going to now stand in recess subject to the call of the chair. And I know the natural question would be exactly what time we're going to be reconvening. And uh, we will certainly give you notice before we reconvene. But at this juncture, I can't say exactly when that will be. And I will tell you that, I will tell you, well, I will tell you that, that one of the reasons is that we want to encourage this process to move along. And so to let those who are crafting this uh, legislation know that uh, we are ready, willing, and able to take it on just as soon as they get it completed is something that, uh, that we want uh, them to be aware of. Well, I'd like to think that the members of the Rules Committee would be able to have a few hours of sleep uh, as this process goes on. Uh, and again, we uh, will have people who will be staying on call, working here in the Rules Committee through the night. And if there are developments, uh, we will certainly be in touch with uh, all the members of the committee to let them know that we will expect to see them uh, return. And I think we'd probably give at least about, uh, I won't go running before we uh, reconvene probably, but maybe a half an hour, an hour's notice maybe before we reconvene, something like that. Yeah, we'll give maybe about a half an hour, an hour's notice before we reconvene. Since Vince just agreed with me. If you would like me in a clean shirt. I'll check out. Well, I'm going to take a shower and uh, I'm going to. Yeah, well, yeah, you might be able to. Any questions? Uh, no, we thank our wonderful uh, audience of people who've uh, stuck with us through the evening, and we'll look forward to reconvening, we hope, in the uh, not-too-distant future. With that, 
The committee stands in recess, subject to the call of the chair. The whole House is expected to take up the managed health care legislation on Thursday as members gavel back in at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. We'll have live gavel to gavel coverage here on C SPAN. Yerkes Observatory is a facility that is uh, recently.